The Indian Act became law in Canada in 1876. We could do a whole podcast series on the effects of the Indian Act. And of course, they're ongoing, because even though there have been amendments, to this day, it's still on the books, still presiding over the daily lives of many First Nation communities. One example of that is barriers it creates economically for accessing things like capital or credit. It makes it very difficult to become creditworthy and get a good credit rating. It has these different impacts that I think people are learning about now. That's John Davey, the Vice President of Indigenous Financial Services at Scotiabank. John's an expert on navigating the laws and regulations that only apply to Canada's Indigenous peoples when it comes to finances. It's tough to start a small business anywhere, on reserve, off reserve, Indigenous, non-Indigenous. But to do it under the constraints and to do it for the community, that is something that's empowering. I don't know if people fully appreciate how much Indigenous peoples can contribute to the Canadian economy. John is our guest today to tell us more about the financial barriers that still exist for Canada's Indigenous peoples, as well as some success stories he's seen when it comes to economic reconciliation, and how the advice his father gave him about taking pride in his Haudenosaunee heritage still informs the work he does today. I'm Stephen Maurice, and this is Perspectives. John, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. So your title, as we heard in the intro, is Vice President of Indigenous Financial Services. This might be a silly question, so forgive me, but why does a bank need Indigenous financial services? See, that's not a silly question at all. But if we were to take a step back and look at Indigenous peoples or Indigenous populations within Canada, based on a 2016 census, so it's certainly out of date at this point, you have roughly 1.7 million people that identify as Indigenous. So it's about 5% of the Canadian population. But within that 1.7 million, you've got three groups. So you've got First Nation peoples like myself, you have Métis, Mm -hmm. and then you have Inuit, which are about 4%. So it's not like it's one Indigenous group. It's not homogenous. There's three distinct groups within it that are constitutionally protected. But then if you get a layer further, you go down a layer, within the First Nation populations, you've got 634 different First Nations, so Mm -hmm. federally recognized bands. With the Métis, you've got the Métis Nation of Canada, and then you've got five provincial affiliates. And then with the Inuit, you've got four different geographic Inuit regions. And if you look at Nunavut alone, you've got 27 different hunter-trap organizations. So the reason I'm bringing this up when you said, well, why do we have Indigenous financial services? It's got everything to do with understanding the diverse populations, not just based on cultures, histories, traditions, and languages when we talk about Indigenous peoples, but more importantly, the legislative frameworks and regulatory frameworks that apply to each one of those groups. So the reason that I would say that we have an Indigenous Financial Services group is because 634 different First Nations, representing 60% of the Indigenous population, are not all under the Indian Act, are not all under the First Nation Fiscal Management Act. There's variation with land tenure systems under the First Nation Land Management Act. There's different regulatory regimes for subsurface rights and mineral rights. So you think oil and gas, you think gravel extraction, things like that, or even timber rights, all of which affect access to capital for each one of those different Indigenous groups and Indigenous Hmm. individuals and Indigenous businesses. Right. So we'll get into quite a bit of that in detail as we move along here. But what are some of the unique considerations, and you've hinted at them already, that Indigenous businesses might face that non-Indigenous businesses would? The best example I can give you, just to be illustrative, Steve, would be looking at Section 89 of the Indian Act. I mean, if you're a non-Indigenous person and you want to get a mortgage, it's quite easy to do if you're creditworthy right? If you're an Indigenous person, Section 89 really undermines all that. Hmm. So again, only applying to First Nation individuals as opposed to Métis and Inuit. Section 89 says any asset that's domiciled on reserve lands, so federal crown lands that are reserved for the use of Indigenous people, any asset that's domiciled on reserve lands can't be seized or garnished. So it completely undermines your collateral base. So if you have a fixture like a house or a chattel like a car, and you're an Indigenous person living on reserve, those assets can't be pledged as collateral to get access to credit. You can't get funds by taking the value in it. And so something that the Indigenous Financial Services team does is we look at the legal instruments that cover the land that could be leveraged to provide value. 
or that we are, we could take a collateral interest or be an approved mortgagee. But that Section 89, when you just look at it, it's only applicable to First Nations peoples with status who are living on reserve or who have assets on reserve. And if you look at the reasons why, well, why would anybody live or start a business on reserve? Well, there's competing incentives sometimes too. There's tax exemption for individuals under Section 87. There's different ways to incorporate business to help manage revenue flow and get a tax benefit or manage revenues in a different way. So, you know, I don't want to say it's just Section 89, but Section 89 is something that is directed at First Nation peoples only. It's not business friendly. It's not customer friendly. It makes it very difficult to become credit worthy and get a good credit rating. And it's probably the best example I can provide is to say, well, why do we need indigenous financial services and what are some of the constraints that only indigenous people feel? Right. So just so I'm clear that I understand this, in order to start or grow business, you need capital. Mm -hmm. In order to get capital, to borrow money, generally speaking, you need to have some kind of collateral to put up against that. Section 89 makes that all but impossible. Does this surprise people? Are people aware of that outside of Indigenous communities? Or? I, I think they're becoming more aware of it. Some of the ancillary impacts of that, right? So when you talk about not being able to get access to capital because you can't leverage your asset base, I mean, that certainly is something that I think is becoming more and more known. I wouldn't even say it's an ancillary effect, but if you look at how that impacts the ability of an Indigenous individual or business or nation, how it impacts their ability to become credit worthy and get a good credit rating. Right. It has these different impacts that I think people are learning about now. So even if you look at it at the retail level, the individual level, you know, if you don't have the ability to use your assets as collateral, how do you get that initial credit card Right. right to build that credit? If your transactions, because you're living on reserve, aren't always captured by credit rating agencies, how do you build a strong credit rating that's going to allow you to start that business or right. going to allow you to make that investment in a bigger asset like a home, right? Hmm. So those are things where I feel that more and more people that I speak to who are non-Indigenous or non-First Nation understand the collateral constraints to some degree, or maybe have a general sense of it, but they don't understand some of the more nuanced impacts that have a very large impact on the ability to get engaged in a local economy, to start your own business, to build your own asset base, to really have control over your own finances from an early period where you can build that credit history. So that's been a bit of an educational experience that I've tried to impart on different people who are curious and who are asking good questions. And going back again quickly to something like Section 89, what would be the reason behind a provision like that? I mean, if you look at the Indian Act where we get Section 89, it's very colonial, very paternalistic legislation. And it's really to protect the liability of the federal government. Hmm. So even if you look at Constitution Act, Section 9124, it makes the responsibility of Indigenous peoples, or at least Indians under the definition, the responsibility of the federal government. And so creating the Indian Act is a way for the federal government to have their fiduciary duty to indigenous populations, but really make sure that they either discharge their liability or that they're indemnified for the acts that take place on those lands. So why does it exist? It goes back a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to look at the spirit and intent of the Indian Act, but I, I do see it as something that is extremely dated. I went to law school. I remember writing my personal statement saying, I want to be leading the charge to repeal the Indian Act. And this is where I don't want to be misconstrued. I don't feel that way anymore. I don't necessarily want to repeal the Indian Act. I want to break it. I want to break it under its own weight. And so when we talk about access to capital and how you can look at the Indian Act or First Nation Land Management Act, there's different instruments under there where the federal government would look at those legal instruments and say, well, if we can't be indemnified for the value of those instruments, we'll want to discharge our liability. And we'll want to essentially hand over the responsibility for that legal instrument or those lands to the First Nations that we're working with. So that's what I'm, you know, in a non-secret way trying to do through the bank, right? Like let's create more value in the instruments, make sure that value is controlled by First Nations and in different indigenous groups and businesses. 
and make it so that the federal government sees the value in saying, well, ownership and control needs to be vested in First Nations. And you work at sort of all levels of business from small business through larger commercial operations? Absolutely. You know, we work a lot with small businesses that are Indigenous. And it's not just First Nation small businesses. It's Métis and, and Inuit. And as you can appreciate through this conversation, the constraints of each different small business, whether you're a First Nation, whether you're a Métis or an Inuit small business are going to look different, whether you're on reserve lands or off reserve lands, whether you're a Métis small business owner in Alberta or outside of Alberta, and an in Inuit, depending on what region you're in, depending on if you're yeah. involved in, a, you know, there's so many different things to consider. But the calculus is relatively similar, whether we're working with an Indigenous small business or a bigger commercial or even corporate client. There's certain first principles we have to look at that could impact any Indigenous business or any Indigenous group that's seeking capital or looking to have their wealth or deposits managed. And it does come back to navigating through those legislative and regulatory regimes. It's just a matter of, first of all, figuring out which ones apply and which ones don't. Hmm. Everything has to be very bespoke. I think that that's something that gets a little misconstrued as well. It's not about recognizing if it's First Nation, Inuit, or Métis. That's very easy to do. It's looking at a First Nation business. Okay, well, is this a First Nation under the Indian Act? Are they under the First Nation Land Management Act land code? Are they under a self-governing agreement? Do they have certain certifications that will help them control the revenue remittance? Revenue remittance modeling is a big part of what we do. And what, so, do what does that mean, revenue so, remittance? So this is another one that gets misconstrued. When I talk about revenue remittance in the context of Indigenous business, so if you earn a dollar off of federal real property, which is reserve land, the federal government wants to make sure the money is being managed in such a way where they have oversight. So the initial setup was any dollar earned, like this is going back 100 years, any dollar earned off the lands goes right back to the government. And then if the nation wants that money, they've got to submit an application saying what the money's for and to show that's for the use and benefit of the band. Revenue remittance is our ability to track a dollar of revenue earned through a First Nation or one of its government business enterprises to make sure that it stays out of Ottawa. So you try and help them keep their money. Absolutely. I mean, we have to be careful too as a financial institution because we know what we like to see, but we can't be in that advisory function. So that could be a referral for us. Mm. Is it just that much harder to do business for an Indigenous community or people getting together to try and start something? I would say so, Steve. Like, this is something where when you think about Section 89, you can't use your assets as collateral. When you think about stuff like, I just described Section 69 of the Indian Act, where nations want to have control over the consolidated revenues they generate. You know, when you think about just those two things, you'd say, well, there's not much incentive to starting a business on mm -hmm. reserve. In a lot of ways, there's not because of those two constraints. But there are tax incentives, as I've alluded to. But it, I think there's something different that you need to consider, and that's that there's a real value to local economy, and there's a real value of being on the lands, and there's a lot of pride Certainly a lot of pride that I feel amongst all my relations in that when you start an Indigenous business and you keep it within the community and you help create that local economic driver, there's an independence there. There's a self-determination there. And I think more importantly, what people are recognizing now is that there's resilience. It's tough to start a small business anywhere, mm -hmm. on reserve, off reserve, Indigenous, non-Indigenous. But to do it under the constraints and to do it for the community and to potentially have the support of the community and the resources, that is something that's empowering. J.P. Gladue is the former head of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. He said something recently that resonated with me, and that's that economic reconciliation when you look at Indigenous groups and Indigenous businesses. This is Canada's competitive advantage. Like, think about the resiliency you would need to be a First Nations business operating on reserve, knowing the constraints I've just described, which aren't even all of them. Mm -hmm. If you have a successful business on reserve, you have to be resilient, you have to be resourceful, you have to be someone that's a great leader and able to really create something that's sustainable despite all these constraints. That shows beyond resilience and perseverance in my mind. Mm. And is business a component of reconciliation? It better it be. <laughs> <laughs> it better be. I mean... Economic reconciliation, it's a term that gets used a lot. I don't know if people fully appreciate how much Indigenous peoples can contribute to 
the national economy. And I got to thank Carol Ann Hilton, who runs the Indigenomics Institute, for helping bring this to light, where right now the Indigenous economy within the Canadian economy is worth about $30 billion year over year based mm -hmm. on estimates. These are estimates that were produced a while ago. Where Carol Ann was saying, and this was prior to COVID, but still resonates now, that the Indigenous contribution to the economy could be close to $100 billion. And so when you look at what that means, you know, I already alluded to more Indigenous involvement in, in major capital projects, not just from an agreements perspective, but from an equity perspective. Right. So there you get, could be anything from major energy corridors to different public works and facilities that are needed throughout the country. There's a lot of opportunity there. But it's also this idea that you're acknowledging and recognizing the resilience I just described when it comes to how difficult it is to be an Indigenous person who is trying to start their own business, who is trying to manage their own nation's revenues, right? Who is working under these different legislative constraints that make access to capital difficult or make mm -hmm. revenue remittance an issue. So when you unlock that talent, it's already started. The talent's already coming up. We're seeing more Indigenous leaders really shape the Canadian economy, what that shows is respect for Indigenous cultures, histories, traditions, and languages, but also mm -hmm. perspective within the idea of a broader economy, whether it's national or whether it's global. So when it comes to reconciliation, a lot of it has to do with honoring the people that came before you and making things better for future generations. All my relations really, I can tell, subscribe to that. And so when you start to make decisions that are for the seven generations to follow, it's got a lot to do with, okay, well, how do we create something that's sustainable? How do we build something that works? And I think that's very applicable to when we talk about principles of starting a new business or creating mm -hmm. a new local economy or even contributing to a major project. Right. And in the four and a half or so years that you've been in this role, are there specific success stories that stand out to you, successes that you've helped to realize? Sure. There is one that comes to mind that I'm really proud of. It was an Inuit deal we did a couple of years ago where we work with five different hunter-trapper organizations who are looking to finance the build of a new fishing vessel, which happens to be, it will be the largest fishing vessel in the country. Hmm. And I want to give all credit to Josh Maye out east, who he and his team, I got the privilege of working with. And just the dialogue is what I'm proud of. It's not the deal itself. I mean, obviously that was done. It's very important. It's what we do as a financial institution. But having that interaction and seeing the respect of the five different leaders within that group and seeing how they interacted and being respectful of their processes. So I was really proud of that. But honestly, Steve, it's some of the smaller deals that get me. And I won't get into them too much, but there's been on more than one occasion We've been asked to submit a proposal. It's usually for financing, you know, a, a new construction, new building or something like that on reserve. There's been a couple of occasions where we've, we've lost, like we lost a deal where, you know, the nation or the business made a decision and unfortunately they've gone with another financial institution. And then a few days later, my phone will ring or I'll get an email saying, hey, we, we noticed this in your proposal and we can't wrap our head around it. Would you mind explaining it again? only to see that group come around and say, you know what, we do want to work with you. And they change mm -hmm. their mind. You know, it doesn't need to be as dramatic as them saying no and then coming back and saying yes. Mm -hmm. That's just the shock value that, you know, I felt. It's more this idea that, you know, when we actually read through it and read through it again, we hadn't seen something like this. We hadn't seen a deal structure like this before. Can you explain it to us? And that's an opportunity for me to say, you know what, if I explain this to you as best as I can, that's knowledge that you're going to have. That's knowledge that you can pass on. That helps me fulfill my obligation to my relations. I'd be more than happy to do it. It's that type of relationship that we form. When that happens, that's what I get excited about. I can only imagine that being an Indigenous person helps you to build the trust that you were talking about. I don't like the idea of, you know, you're Indigenous, I'm Indigenous, let's do business. I mm -hmm. think there's something to be said about having pride in your heritage, which I certainly have. But I think it goes back to something my dad said to me before I left to go away to university. So I was leaving home, leaving the comforts of my community where everyone knew who I was and knew my family, knew that my father was from Six Nations, he was holding a show from Six Nations and my mother wasn't. And I was going off and I was nervous because 
I don't always match what people expect to see when I talk about my indigenous heritage and my pride in my indigenous culture. But what my dad said to me, and I remember it was in the garage where he spent a lot of time in the garage in our family home, and I remember it vividly. He said, listen, if you have something substantive to say, you're always going to have an audience. You know, so work hard in school. And that was his way of saying, listen, like, it doesn't matter what you look like. You've got values that we've instilled in you. You've got pride in your heritage. Demonstrate that pride. Be a proud Haudenosaunee person. So I try to bring that to any relationship I have or try to form through the bank as well. You know, how is it that I can bring something that's useful, that's substantive, that's purposeful, that's going to contribute to whoever I'm working with to help them fulfill the same goal I have, which is honoring our ancestors and making things better for future generations. I think that's a really great story to end on. I really appreciate you coming and talking to us. It's been really interesting. Hey, Steve, thanks very much. I really appreciate this. I've been speaking with John Davey. He is Vice President of Indigenous Financial Services at Scotiabank. The Perspectives podcast is made by me, Stephen Maurice, Armina Lagaya, and our producer, Andrew Norton. For a transcript of this episode, visit our website, scotiabank.com slash perspectives. We'll see you next time.